I'm Sean. I'm Laura. And I'm Alice. We're a theatre company of three, telling stories around the whole country. But now we're stuck at home, with just a microphone. Welcome to Stories from the... Wait, okay. One, two, three, four. Welcome to Stories from the Sticks, brought to you by Scratchworks Theatre Company. Whilst we can't be on the road, we're bringing stories from the road to you. Episode 2, Fran and Jan. Hi. Hi, we're back. We're Us again. <laughs> Week 2. It's hot, guys. Oh my gosh. It is warm it's in so here. so hot. I'm trying the thing of drinking a hot tea on a hot day and hoping that it will do that magic inside when you're suddenly cool but it's not quite just sweat yet. it all out oh yeah how's it working for you it's very sweaty not gonna lie <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we have to have all the windows and doors shut to make it sound nice when you're recording so there's no air moving <laughs> it's perfect you're just sitting in stagnant air it's beautiful <laughs> so here that's we are. an image for our listeners <laughs> yeah mm. Stagnant sweaty air. Laura. Mm, <laughs> sweaty Laura. I mean, if they've, seen, if they've seen the show, it's not the first time. <laughs> no, it's Scratchworks in our natural form. Yeah. yeah. Just it wouldn't be a, around. It wouldn't be a Scratchworks, uh, I'd say show, but scra- Scratchworks creative endeavour without some kind of sweat. No. <laughs> yeah. Blood, yeah. sweat and more sweat. <laughs> no tears. Nearly <laughs> <laughs> sweat. Well, not today anyway. Not right now. No. no. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> so in episode one, we wanted to give everyone a bit of an introduction to rural touring, as that's what inspired us all for this podcast. But a massive thing which is part of your experience when you tour to, to rural locations is how well you're looked after. Because unlike a venue, we you know turn up, we build our set, we perform our shows, we, we say hello to audiences and we leave. You're there for a whole day in a remote location without any other local shops or places to visit and you're really integrated into the community and they really look after you. Oh my gosh, we've had such good food. We always, uh, <laughs> so they always offer you like a meal before the show, which is wonderful, but we tend to overeat not i mean speaking for myself but i think we speak for everyone we absolutely (laughs) cram our bellies full of all this delicious home-cooked food so for that reason we have to eat four hours in advance of the show because otherwise we'd just be stumbling around in a food coma so we can't um, contain ourselves so i know we just can't we can't look at a steamy delicious cheesy lasagna and not eat all of it it's but not possible. <laughs> we've crafted the perfect timeline of how to fill your belly, digest, and then do an hour and a half very physical performance. If you eat by three o'clock, you're good to go for 7.30. Yeah, it's the perfect time. Mm. And oh, the food. We've had delicious homemade quiches, so veggie So many lasagnas. quiches. Oh. Yeah. I have a really vivid image of, I can't remember the venue, but it was... Um, and I, the host was putting us up and there was this beautiful house that was overlooking these rolling hills because it was right up top. And oh, it was, it was near Glastonbury. Balcony. Where was yeah. that? Yeah. And Lam-yat. they had... Lamyat. Is that mm. Lamyat? With the strawberries. Mm. <gasps> and the quiche. It was like triple quiche, I swear. We had triple quiche. And I just quiche. remember being like, glorious sunshine. We were fed and watered so well. And basically then just rolled down the hill to get back to the venue, thank (laughs) God. She put these two giant quiches in front of us and I think she expected something to be left over. (laughs) There was nothing left over. There wasn't. (laughs) And it feels a really nice, it's a really lovely exchange because you're turning up there. Obviously it is our job and it's what we've been put there to do, but we're turning up and we're setting up and entertaining you know in theory the whole town and village you know that evening and there's a bit of an exchange because then they're they're looking after you and 
you know feeding you and you're sharing a meal so it's a really lovely it feels quite an old-fashioned way of theatre but it's, it's so lovely a bit of like I'll do something for you and you do something for me which is which is lovely as we reflect on all the delicious meals we've shared on tour we know we're very lucky during the COVID-19 pandemic, UK food banks have seen attendance nearly double. As incomes are hit hard, people are going hungry. If you are able to make a donation, check out the Trestle Trust website to find your local food bank and check what donations they need right now. The link is in the show notes. Who's up for today's episode? It's me! And I'm going to be interviewing Fran and Jan from Martinstown. Hey, it's Alice. Today we are zooming across the southwest to the county of Dorset. We made this ferry journey back in February 2020, before lockdown even seemed possible. We arrived in the little village of Martinstown on a quiet Sunday morning. Here we met Fran and Jan welcoming hosts and a perfect rhyming double act who plied us with cups of tea and homemade soup before the show. Even then, it was clear to us that they were very good friends. But listen closely to their stories and you can hear that they are quite different people. And like many friendships, their differences balance the other's character wonderfully. Martinstown is a village with history growing out of its soil and flowing down the river. As idyllic as it sounds, there's a glimmer of mischief behind its charm. From competitive garden growing to disastrous desserts and wading through water in your wellies all for a silly old duck race. There's always a sense of fun and a joy of being in it together. First up is Fran. She's lived in the village much longer, says Jan. She'll know all the stories better than me. So, Fran, can you tell me where you are this morning? Where am I? I'm in the kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, what are your surroundings like? What, my immediate surroundings? Well, put it this way. And beyond. I've I've, I've washed the kitchen floor specially. (laughs) Excellent. And where all our listeners are appreciating the very washed kitchen. (laughs) I've even pushed the hoover around, so that shows you how special you are. (laughs) Excellent. And what's Martinstown looking like today? Um, quiet, very quiet. Um, mm-hmm. I've been and done the uh, the uh, the daily dog walk, and uh, I, with my little black bag. I did have a discussion the other day about the size and shape of a poo dog poo bag, so which was quite entertaining. That shows you how bored we are. <laughs> Is that with a passerby? Yes, with a with a fellow dog owner. <laughs> and what was the discussion? Well, which, where was the best place to buy dog, doggy poo bags? Right. So is it um, Pets R Us or is it... Uh, so my friend decided actually Pets R Us was better because they were bigger. But then she's got a bigger dog than I've got. <laughs> Tell me a bit more about your first impressions of Martinstown. Okay. Well, if you, it depends what time of year. Um, if it's sort of harvest time or silaging time, because we have a, you know, the, the tractor Grand Prix roaring through the village. We've just finished that because um, um, silaging is now finished, so it's all gone a bit quiet again. But I, I reckon they have races. It's who can get to the, back to the farm the quickest. The relationship in, relationships within the village and the farmers is usually pretty good. I mean, for example, we've got a sheep farmer and he's been keeping his, lawn, his orphan lambs outside his house in a, in a sort of marked off area, in a pen. And of course, everybody walking past, it's been a real uplift. And seeing these lambs chattering away, but it was hysterical the other day because they managed to escape. And Richard, the farmer, went up, went up the hill with these lambs following him and the, all the traffic in the village stopped. <laughs> oh no! Because <laughs> he'd crossed over from the green. They got, they got onto the green. So he collected them for the green and was then taking them back up to the field. (laughs) It was very funny. At last, we found something to stop the blinking traffic. (laughs) 
Richard's the farmer, the sheep farmer, okay. with the pet lambs. Last year, no, two years ago, we, he kept them just up the lane from me. And one of them managed to break her, break her leg. No, this main flock was over the other side of, off towards Bridport somewhere. Long breedy. And, um, and so he, he kept the orphan lambs here. And then uh, one day, Martha, because he gives them all names, as you do, <laughs> when you're an old softy like Richard. And one day, um, Martha broke her back leg. And uh, so he took it, took it to the vet. And the vet said, do you know, I've never put a splint on a, on a lamb before. Because normally, they, the, the animal would just be put down and then we'd be eating lamb chops run. Mm. <laughs> um, so uh, Martha's still going strong. Ah, oh, good to hear. So that, she must be now two years old. And now we've got the new lambs. They're starting to, they're going to be put up here as well, which is lovely. Oh, the, the, best season, the best time to come through the village, I, I reckon, is early spring when we have this fantastic display of daffodils. These daffodils were planted some years ago, and I think we probably were the first village to do it. But the, the, they go all the way along the bank of, of our little river. And um, it's just absolutely glorious scene. And so it's all very colourful. And then on, my, on the outside of my house, I have... Uh, what I call my hysteria. Actually, it's wisteria, but it's absolutely gorgeous in the, again, in the spring. But it doesn't actually belong to me. It belongs to my next door neighbour. So the plant has come up, up the side of, my, up the side of his house and across to mine because we're, we're semi-detached. Mm. And then it's crawled all the way along the front of my house. So every now and again, Mike, my neighbour, says to me, he's, he's a uh, retired farmer, he says, if you don't behave yourself, I'm going to cut this wisteria down. <laughs> because his blooms are very paltry and mine are very luxurious. <laughs> so, so uh, a, bit of a, uh, a competition about who's got the most luxurious flowers. Well, there is on my behalf, yes. <laughs> oh, good. So it's a one-sided competition. <laughs> yes, there's nothing like a nice little competition. Particularly with wind up with the neighbours. It does some good. But during this, this uh, you know, being confined to barracks, it's been amazing, you know, particularly the dog walkers, because everybody walks past with their dogs first thing in the morning. There's always a, morning, how are you? Are you okay? Yes. Still healthy? Yes, fine. <laughs> and so there's this constant chatter going on with, amongst residents, even if they're not dog owners, because they go up to the shop to get their newspaper. So as a community, I think it's, it's still thriving and uh, maintaining cheerfulness and this, you know, extreme situation so, uh, of the lockdown. When we were in Martinstown back in February, I remember seeing lots of flood defences on the houses. Has that been an issue? Well, it has, it has flooded. We have had floods here. Um, back in uh, 55, there was a horrendous re rainstorm. And I think we were in the, we are in the, uh... oh, hang on. Can I stop? Yeah. There's a knock at Fran's door. And you can't ignore a knock at the door in lockdown. Maybe it's an important delivery or a message from a friend. I asked Fran recently. She couldn't really remember. Maybe it was a parcel? We'll never know. That's okay. No worries. So we were just talking about the, uh, the flooding. Uh, the flooding, yes. 1955, um, I think there was something like 12 inches of, water, of rain fell and it was in the Guinness Book of Records. Oh, really? As having the highest rainfall. I think we've probably been beaten since. I'm sure we have. During that storm... Um, there was a boy that went into the river and actually got stuck in a culvert and um, he drowned. Oh. And his brother, who, um, the, the, they were a local family, mm. and his brother always remained living on that side of the, of the uh, very close to where his brother had died. Oh. His, his, uh, it was his younger brother, I think. And so um, he was called uh, Egbert. Well, Bert the Egg, he was known, because he kept chickens. A lovely old man. And then eventually he moved out of the house 
that he was living in and eventually bought, another, bought a plot of land and built another house. Mm. So, um, and that's where he stayed until he died. And I can't remember when he died, but it's, you know, it's the last, last 15 years, I suppose. And he was a great stalwart in the pub. Uh, <laughs> you always find Bert in the pub, <laughs> propping yeah. up the bar. The pub seems like quite a lively little um, hub of the community. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's absolutely great. Um, if we didn't have, it's been so sad with the, with the lockdown that we haven't been able to go to the pub and uh, really concerned about, and we're all very concerned about their livelihood because they're a young family with mm. three, three little boys. And you wonder how those sorts of people, you know, keep going. And uh, fingers crossed. But they are starting up, um, I think they're starting up a new venture of takeaway foods. Okay. So Thursday nights, curry nights. So my name's down for that one. <laughs> yeah. So what with the, the shop and the pub, you know, I think people are, are trying to make sure that we, we keep them. Mm. Yeah. Because if we, if we lose those, then we lose the heart of the village, I think. No, it is a lovely, lovely little river. And um, the people who live alongside the river, they have what's known as riparian rights. And they are responsible to keeping their part of the river clear. Right. So, and that's another thing in the spring, usually. You see all these, these people down in the river, up to, their, up to their wellies in water, clearing out all the, all the guns, you know, all the growth, all the vegetation. And uh, so that's another sort of thing that happens in, in the spring. And if they don't uh, clear it, then the, the neighbours on either side complain. Oh, really? Yes. Because it runs right alongside one side of the road and you've got yes. little kind of crossings and bridges over to people's houses that are on yeah. the other side of it. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's quite nice at night sometimes if I go out to just let the dog out last thing and it's really quiet. You can hear the sort of the, the bubbling of the water. It's very calming. Yeah. Lovely sound. I love the sound of water. With the lockdown, we, we've been, uh, like everybody else, going out and clapping for the NHS and the care workers and the key workers. And every evening, eight o'clock, we all go out. And then Howard, who's the chief bell ringer, he, he goes and pulls the bell. And uh, so we're there all clapping and then this bell is ringing. Oh, it makes the hair stand on the back of my neck. It's so beautiful sound on that quiet, you know, Thursday evening, hardly a sound and there, apart from the clapping. And oh, it's wonderful. And then when we had the VE day, mm. we, all, we all stood on the green um, and I remember the choir. So the choir and the musicians stood on the green and we sang, the Vera Ling, uh, we, we'll meet again, mm -hmm. and Jerusalem. And when we finished singing, it all went quiet. And then the bells started ringing again. Oh, I could have cried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an emotional time, isn't it? It is. It's wonderful. And, you know, he's, he's a very quiet and self-contained man. So if you see him, say, you know, hello, Howard, all right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> but he's lovely. He's a really kind man and he's just a you know he's a man man of the community was that in early lockdown stages yes yes and of course there was great question as to whether we should be gathering whoops on the green yeah but we're just a small group and i suppose we're a group of about 20 mm. and we just we just spread out yeah but when we did the ve day celebration um there were quite a lot of people heard about it and so they came came out to listen to us Mm. and uh, there were some cars went through and a, and a friend of mine who's a, who's a retired policeman said that one of those cars was an unmarked police car whoops <laughs> but they didn't stop but they I guess stop. If, you're, if you're socially distancing then yeah, yeah I think you've got to, as they said you've got to show common sense and I think for something like that which is good for the community and good for people's mental health mm -hmm. I know they keep banging on about that but it is important yeah. And it's just lovely to feel that you're still part of something instead of being, you know, tucked away somewhere. And what was it like being singing in a choir where you're very spread out? Because you've done oh, that. It's a bit weird. It's a bit weird. You feel as though you're doing, you're doing a solo. 
And I thought, oh, stuff it. Let's go for it. <laughs> Then uh, everybody scampered off then back to their various you know, areas in the village um, and uh, sat down and consumed the cake and the sandwiches and the wine and said, the parting went on, <laughs> the celebrations went on, but the bunting was everywhere. But there was a there was a one one old boy who who was actually he was a fighter pilot in in the war, and he arrived on the green, you know, to listen to us sing, and he'd got his medals on and everything. But he he lived in a bungalow going out of the village off towards uh, Hardy's Monument, and in the winter he, the the bungalow is underneath one of the hills, and in the winter there was so much water that he had an uh, you know an influx of uh, of mud. So it came in through the back door and out through the front. And again, another example of the community working together. As soon as everybody heard about it, they were up there helping him, you know, rescuing his stuff, lifting up his furniture. Mm. Um, and he's now living as a, in one of the B&B rooms in the pub because he's still waiting as, you know, for, for, the, for his house to be repaired. Oh, wow. The builders can't get in there at the moment because of the, or because of the shutdown. If your village was a dessert, what would it be? Oh, if my village was a dessert, what would it be? Bread and butter pudding. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know why? No idea. Do you think it's quite traditional? I think it's a traditional place. Yes, I think so. Um, I mean, there's a lot of new people come into the village, which has been great because we were becoming rapidly becoming a, a sort of a place for the, for the old age pensioners. Uh, but now, of course, we've got young families moving in uh, and, and younger people. So younger people able to take over from us old fogies with things like, you know, the village hall and, and uh, arts reach. <laughs> well, it'd be a long time before I give that up. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's just such an important thing for me. Yeah. When did you start uh, doing promoting for arts reach? Oh, must be now. Um, nine nine years ago i think nine ten years ago i think and then uh, and then i had a couple of people who helped me but but they didn't stay very long i think they found it too i don't know why they they didn't get the same buzz out of it as i do so along came jan jan and i said do you want to come and help me with arch reach yeah i'll help you and we're we are a fantastic team and and when it comes to this, uh, count, counting the money it's hysterical it's absolutely hysterical <laughs> Some time ago, for Arts Reach, we did a documentary, um, which I think is still on YouTube, if you, if you want to have a look at it sometime. And Jan and I were interviewed, 
and also this lovely friend said who comes and helps us and he was widowed uh, about five five six years ago i suppose and he he talked about the importance of what arts rich had done for him because we've sort of swept him up and said come on said we need help with this or we need help with that and he oh all right and he comes along and he helps put the furniture you know the chairs away at the end and and sometimes they say, it's not my sort of stuff, or else he sits there and enjoys it and realizes actually he has enjoyed it. We've managed to convert him. <laughs> That's good. That's but when, when our, the, our, the group at Arts Reach, you know, Kerry saw, they, I went up to collect some flyers or something, and Kerry said they'd just seen the rushes of, of the documentary. And she said, when we saw said, we all cried. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so... Have a look at it sometime if you can find yeah. it. It didn't take long for Jan to come up in conversation. Fran and Jan clearly have a wonderful friendship and together they do so much for the village. So I decided to give Jan a call and see whether she'd be happy to give her side of the story. Fran was saying that you two end up struggling with counting the money. <laughs> It's shocking, really. It's absolutely appalling. My theory is that if we did it separately, we'd actually be all right. She's actually better at maths than I am. She, she can add up much more quickly. I always have to do it with pencil and paper. But um, we've got slightly different... I think it's one of the reasons why we work well together. We've got slightly different strengths. I kind of organise things in a particular way. Fran's really, really good at... Um, she's very... Um, uh, positive and can do and that sort of thing so, so we, we sit there and, and we try and get this money to balance and it never ever don't tell arts riches it never ever balances um we can never make it right and it's because you know maybe we've missed a phone call for booking tickets or something like don't tell arts reach this um <laughs> jan it's a podcast <laughs> i don't care really uh, yvonne, yvonne and kerry know that we that 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 we sit and, and uh, we, we have stopped Fran and I have stopped having wine before we count the money now if we're going to do it in the evening we actually do the money first and then we have the glass of wine or we do it during the day and we have the cup of coffee but we've we've always managed to make it work and of course um on a slightly more serious note with arts which you've always got the bar and the raffle so you've got a little bit of of uh, money to make sure that arts reach does get its it's proper cut because that's so important arts reach is just wonderful yeah and you know over the years you'll you'll get a system fine-tuned uh, yes, <laughs> yes. We, we possibly will i don't think fine-tuning is quite the kind of uh feeling that i that uh, fran and i generate really it's more sort of oh look uh, let's bumble along and 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 do the best we can so what can you tell me a bit more about these community lunches ah uh, um yes it was fran's idea originally and they decided that every month they'd put on a lunch and the idea really was to try and get um the more isolated um probably older people to come down and do something social which it doesn't really do because because it it tends to be a lot of the people who are friends anyway and the sort of people who would come out to to things in the village hall um anyway there, there are a few people who perhaps wouldn't come out as much without that and so um each month we get a couple of people who do a main course or one person will do a main course so fran is often main course with another friend of ours, ours who's also a church warden uh, dick and they they will do oh i don't know let's say ginger beef or something um, and I do puddings, and my, my expertise is pudding. So I'll, I'll sort of rush around making puddings for, up, well, 40-odd people, but with puddings, I always want seconds. Um, and, so, and so somebody, we rush down to the village hall carrying all this stuff um, and then serve it up. Uh, at Christmas, we have 50 people. Sometimes we have, we have 60, actually. Um, but there's, there's a team. So there are, uh, there are another three or four people who regularly come to help. Um, perhaps they're cooks one month. And there's a, a, a lovely chap who's newish in the village. He's only been here a couple of years and he already volunteered here, isn't he? he and his wife. He comes and washes up, stands at the sink and washes up. And then we've got Cedric, who's another friend of ours. Um, he takes the money 
and Dick organises the wine and it, it's very jolly. It's very social. And most months I go, for oh, goodness sake, I'm fed up with doing this. I'd never want to do it again. And then I get down the hall and it's, it's, it's just nice to see everybody. Um, and I've got to know what people's favourite puddings are. So uh, Frank or Michael, his favourite is Spotted Dick. So I have to make him Spotted Dick. I've never made Spotted Dick before in my life. <laughs> and then there's somebody else, actually, he's sadly gone into a care home recently. But his favourite is Treacle Tart. So Spotted Dick, Treacle Tart, bread and butter pudding, um, that kind of thing. All with lashings of cream. Well, that brings me on to a wonderful question that we've been yeah. asking people, which is, if Martinstown was a dessert, what would it be? Oh, um, what immediately springs to mind is actually bread and butter pudding, because that's that lovely combination of, of, of the sweet and, um, oh, I don't know, it's so succulent bread and butter pudding with, all, with lots and lots of the, the raisins and, and sultanas all dotted through, which is like all the def different people all dotted through and then you get the lovely crispy crunchy crust which is <laughs> uh no perhaps i had better go down that <laughs> there's a crispy crunch and then you, you pour lashings of cream on it so it's it's sweet and yes i think it would be bread and butter pudding you know what funnily enough fran said bread and butter pudding as Did well she really yeah <laughs> how funny isn't that amazing now, she's yeah. fran hasn't got a sweet tooth at all she's not interested in puddings no she uh she did tell me about her famous muesli oh pudding. the muesli pudding jan for example makes the most fabulous puddings and then sometimes she'll say i think somebody else should do a pudding so i go and i don't eat pudding i'm not interested in pudding but i go yeah i'll make a pudding i'll do a pudding for you so i made this pudding and it was called muesli pudding i got off the internet I like muesli, <laughs> so I made this muesli pudding and so much I went in the bin and every now and again I'll say, you know, when they go, oh, somebody, used to, uh, somebody else pudding and um, I'll do a pudding, I'll do a muesli pudding and they all go, no. <laughs> now I'm allowed to do soup and I help with the main, I'd always, do, you know, help with the main course or, or vegetables or something, but um, so the savoury stuff, but puddings, I'm kicked off. Oh. So that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't that bad. It was grim. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. It, it, it was indescribable, actually. It really was indescribable. <laughs> it, was, it was sort of brown and sat <laughs> there. And people were very kind and they ate it, some of it. Um, and now if Fran wants to really worry me, she'll say, shall I make a, a measly pudding? If you were to walk around Martinstown listening to a piece of music, yeah. what sort of music would it be or what song in particular? Well, I was thinking about that as I was walking this morning because I, I sing, I sing with several choirs and I sing with a small group. So um, there's lots to choose from, but I think it would be, I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Brendan Taff and he's written the most beautiful song called Wester Caput. And it's sort of taken from Psalm, is it 100, oh, which one is it? 100 and something, to the hills I will lift mine eyes. And um, he wrote it when he was doing a, a residency in Scotland. And he came down and, and we did, a, a, one of the choirs I sing with, we did um, a, 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 an evening workshop with him and he taught it to us. And it's, it, it's about, it's, it says, to the hills I will lift mine eyes and I am not, I am not afraid. In the morning sun and the evening night, my courage or my courage will not fail. And it's it's a very, it's beautiful. The harmonies are absolutely beautiful. And uh, we sing it with one of the choirs that I sing with. And it, it usually reduces me to tears. And I think it would be that. I live in a, in a wonderful place surrounded by beautiful hills. And I think particularly at the minute, you kind of want that encouragement, don't you? I am not, I am not afraid, even though sometimes I think, we are a bit afraid, but there we are. To the hills I will lift my eyes, and I am not, not afraid. To the hills I will lift my eyes, and I am not afraid. To the
This is Brendan Taft's Wester Capith. When we contacted him about using the song, he revealed that it should be pronounced Capith, not Caputh, which is how it's written. He said, It's named after a hostel in Perthshire where I ran a singing course in 2011. The biggest lesson I learned is to give your songs easy to pronounce names, especially when they later become your most popular track. Have you been doing much Zoom choiring? Oh, it's awful. Zoom choiring is, is absolutely awful. Uh, no, I shouldn't say that really. Um, it's, it just makes me sad. Um, the, the, main, the, the choir that I've been singing with for longest, our musical director has set up and she's worked really hard on it and really got the tech on under her belt. And, you know, she prepares it incredibly well, but it's just not the same. Um, but I sing with a small group and for the first time last week they came round here and we sang in my garden and they're coming this afternoon and to actually sing live with people it was I can't tell you it it, it just lifted my spirit so much and we were singing one of the songs we're working on is um uh blackbird singing the dead of night oh yeah yeah and we were singing it working on it in in the garden and the blackbird was joining in it was just it was kind of, woo, spooky, spooky. What were your first memories of Fran? Well, I've known Fran for donkey's years because we were both teachers. And we both taught in Weymouth and she taught in a very similar school to mine. So I'd meet her at, um, uh, oh, I don't know, um, insect days and stuff like that and then um, I was recruited to become a literacy coordinator because I've got the gift of the gab and I sound as though I know what I'm talking about I can sound incredibly convincing <laughs> even if I'm not and uh, so I was doing this this literacy coordinators thing so I'd see Fran at courses and conferences and such like then there was a really embarrassing um, thing when they sent Fran who'd been teaching longer than I had to observe me teaching literacy and it was it was awful because Fran did not need to observe anybody teaching literacy um, and after that I, I resigned from being a literacy coordinator because I thought this is this is awful and, and I didn't know she lived in Martinstown I didn't know she lived uh, literally a stone's throw from where I live until she got in touch and, and she came up here to talk about literacy. And she said, I didn't know you lived here. So my earliest memories of her are all to do with teaching and the ghastly literacy strategy and, and being very embarrassed. <laughs> so we, we quite often laugh about that. Because Fran's very modest. She won't ever blow her own trumpet, but she, she was a cracking good teacher. We used to meet up at various conferences and courses. And then as it got closer to my retirement, I'd say, do you know, Jan, I have, I've only got another month or so. And she'd go, shut up. Because <laughs> she's younger than I am, you see. So she had to go on. <laughs> so, and then to my amazement, she, turned, she was living in Winsbourne Abbas. And then I think at some stage she bought a house in, in Martinstown. And then, oh, there you are. <laughs> she popped up again. <laughs> so were you living in Martinstown the whole time? Yes, yeah, so we lived, we moved out to the village as a family when we were living in Weymouth and my oldest son, well, most of my sons were at a, um, a school in Weymouth, primary school in Weymouth, and my oldest son was receiving a lot of pressure. Oh, Mrs. Taylor, he's not going to get 11 plus. I didn't care a toss whether he got his 11 plus or not. I wanted him to be happy. So we moved out here because I wanted him to go to a nice little village school, which he did. And I wanted him to go on, or wanted them to go on to, um, into the comprehensive system because Dorset was just about, Dorchester rather, was just about to go comprehensive. So no 11 plus. So we skipped off and <laughs> came here. And I'd always said to my husband, I never want to live in a village because people, everybody knows your business. I'm a tourney. So I've been here the last 40, 50 years now. So. <laughs> and everybody does know your business. <laughs> But in these times, do you think that's a good thing? Yes, I think so, yeah. I mean, certainly, um, I mean, the, the strength of community when, you know, so much, 
something horrible happens to you, like when my husband died. I mean, the people around here were absolutely wonderful. One day I was, after he died, I was at home and the curtains were still drawn. My neighbour across the way knocked on the door. You all right? Yeah, yeah. Your curtains were drawn. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm fine. And um, no, they're an ama- it's an amazing community. Mm. And I think even shown with this lockdown, there's always somebody knocking on the door and saying, you okay? You know, do you need any shopping? All that sort of thing's going on. And that shows you the strength of the community. It's so important. I sometimes wish I knew more of my neighbours. It strikes me from our conversations that a lot of what makes a place like Martinstown tick is very much those individuals feeling yeah. like it's their role. And if they don't do it, then no one else will. Yeah. yeah. About the bell ringing and the yeah. you taking yeah. over Arts Reach and the lady that runs the shop and even down yeah. to the farmer kind of putting his lambs on display just to yeah. throw on a sense of spring and optimism and hope. And I think that's really, that's really important. I mean, one of the things that, that happens every two years is the pantomime. But this, that, that was, we had the first pantomime and it was Snow White. And it was started by somebody called uh, Anne Matthews. That's right. I should know that. That's my son's name. And she, she started it. And we have this pantomime ever since. But the, rec- the recent pantomime has been pantomime in three weekends. Because when the, the other, the original pantomimes they was they became so staged and so professional and it, it was just amazing the, the hours of work that went into it hours and hours um so now there's a small group of us do a thing called or who's you know directed and started it up is a thing called panto and three weekends and that is absolutely brilliant because you you get your cast together we all meet up on the friday night the next the next day work all day saturday work all day sunday the following weekend, all uh, Friday, all day Saturday. So it goes on until the final weekend, which is um, dress rehearsal on the Friday evening, which is usually dire. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then performance on the Saturday. And the attendance we get then from the from the community is amazing. It's always a complete sellout because they th- they think we're all so daft and silly, and we we make such amazing mistakes. And, but it's really good fun and it's done and dusted in three weekends. I think that's wonderful because the audience love an element of risk. They love yes. watching things go a bit wrong. So were you in the, have you been in these pantos? Oh, yes. Yes. I usually play the daft drunk. <laughs> I can't think why. <laughs> What's your favourite role that you've ever done in a Oh, favourite role? Uh, I don't know. I've just enjoyed them all, really. Uh, we, we did Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and, and this time I was, I was one of the dwarves. And, one of the ch- and of course, we get the children involved. Mm. So they, they come along and they, they enjoy it. And there's this little girl, she's only about, about five or six, and she and I had to go on stage, and we had water pistols, so she loved that because she's get, trying to get her brother. And so we finish our bits, and, they're, and behind, they're behind waiting to come on. They come on too early. This child, age five, turns around and screeches at them, not now. <laughs> and they went, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, Jan, have you got one more story you'd like to share about Martinstown? Of course, there was the, the time when we all cleared out the stream to, to have a duck race. <laughs> yes tell me more so we just decided to clear a section from one bridge to another effectively it was planned that we would all meet on that particular morning in our wellies and such like and we got down there and we all started with our hose and our rakes and our, and then somebody said what about vials disease there are rats and so somebody rushed in and, and, and got us some marigold gloves so that we actually <laughs> had got these gloves on and then um we got to sort of more or less opposite friends, actually. And she came out and, uh, and, and decided to join in, of course. Um, and then we all sat on the green and had coffee. It's not really a particularly interesting story, but it was just the, the idiocy of, of this bunch of people. Because we were all in our 60s. Some of us, I mean, Cedric would have been, 
yeah, it wasn't all that long ago. So he was sort of late 70s, scrambling down the edge of the stream in our wellies, trying to get this wretched thing cleared for a duck race. You know, why Why would you do that? And how many ducks took part? Um, there was quite a big fleet, actually. I think there were 50. That, you, you do understand that we're talking little plastic ducks. Ah, I thought you meant real ducks. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but plastic ducks. You don't have real ducks in a duck race. And there are 50 yellow plastic ducks with numbers on them. And so people people buy a duck. So you go to, it's usually in the shop. Um, you put your name down, I'll have number 27. And if number 27 wins, then you win, I don't know what it might be, probably not a great deal of money in our open gardens because we it mean on the prices. <laughs> if you had to leave Martinstown tomorrow, Ooh. what would you miss the most? Oh, oh um, the, the people, my friends, my neighbours, the community, uh, and most definitely. I've, I've got absolutely wonderful neighbours up here where I, I, I'm just up here. I'm slightly up the, the, the hill on the opposite side. Um, wonderful neighbours and such lovely friends. I know. I, oh, I can't bear the thought. Don't want to leave Martin's town, thank you. What would I miss the most? The companionship the sense of community, the sense of being part of something, very much part of something, knowing everybody that, you know, you meet on a sort of, I mean, there are obviously some people that, that you don't know, but on the whole, I think it's just that this feeling of sort of well-being, and that sounds a bit crass really, but, but it is, it's just that feeling of warmth, um, friendship, affection. And when all this is over, We've all decided that we're going to have a mammoth uh, picnic on the green because that the, the green again is sort of fairly essential to the village because that's where all the things happen like open gardens um, and all those community things which go together to make to make us a whole really. But we are going to have a mammoth picnic on the green as we've had in the past. But this time it'll be going around giving hugs to everybody. <laughs> yeah, because that's what that's what we will be missing. Yeah, you know, that, that contact. Well, it's been lovely to talk to you, Fran. Yeah, Thank I hope you. I've not waffled on too much. Oh, no, it's been great. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing your morning with me. Not, not at all. Well, well, give my love to the team. Well, Say, love, to, love to see them again. You must come to Martinstown again sometime. I, I, we, I'm sure we'd love to come back. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to chat up Archreach. <laughs> yeah, when this all blows over. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me today, Jan. Thank you. It's been it's been uh, very very nice and nice to chat to somebody different. <laughs> Since speaking to Fran and Jan, I found the mini documentary on YouTube, the one about Arts Reach, which features both of them talking about what it means to have live performances in the village. It's so lovely to see them in the flesh, sorting out the bar and setting up the chairs even if it's a little bittersweet right now. Hopefully one day we will be back in Martinstown with another live performance. You have been listening to Stories from the Sticks, created by Scratchworks Theatre Company. We'd like to say a huge thank you to Fran and Jan for sharing their stories and a big thanks to Kerry and Yvonne at ArtsReach for all their support. To see Fran and Jan in the flesh, you can find the link to the Arts Reach documentary in the show notes. Our original song, You're Frozen, was arranged by Sean Keane. And another thank you to Brendan Taff for letting us use Wester Capith in the episode. To hear more music by Brendan Taff, and you can even buy his album on a donation basis, check out the show notes also. If you want to see photos of Scratchworks exploring Martinstown before lockdown, head to the podcast page on our website, scratchworkstheatre.com. You can also sign up to the Scratchworks mailing list to keep up to date with our news or find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Also, we would like you to get creative in response to our podcast. Our creative question is, if your town or village was a dessert, what would it be? How you respond is completely up to you. Send us your drawings, paintings, songs, poems, or even baked goods. A picture rather than the baked goods themselves. And we will be sharing them on our website and social media platforms. 
creating a colourful, delicious spread of hometown-inspired desserts from across the country. This podcast was edited by Andrew Armfield and the music composed by Jack Dean. Stories from the Sticks is supported by Arts Council England. Episode 3 is on its way very soon.